Hey, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Angular Air. I am your host, Justin Schwarzenberger. And on today's episode, we are going to be learning about Angular Doc Team Service. Uh, pretty excited about this. It's some tooling that does some static analysis of our Angular applications, helps us get better insights and understanding and knowledge of our Angular apps and what they're, what's going on in them. So looking forward to learning about that. Uh, let's say hi to our panelists, and we'll say hi to our guests. And uh, we'll get started. Actually, our panelists had to step away for a minute. It's Mike Brocky, so we'll say hi to him in a minute when he gets back. But uh, let's meet our guest, Hanyu Xiao. Hanyu, how's it going? Good. Thank you, Justin, for having me. And hello, everyone. Well, thank you very much for taking the time and doing an episode for us. We're, we're looking forward to it. Hanyu, do you want to tell our guests a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, well, uh, basically, um, uh, I'm a founder of Angular Doc, and uh, uh, it's a, a JavaScript TypeScript tooling uh, that mainly performs the um, uh, static code analysis for your projects. Uh, we extract metadata from your source code, and then we piece together your overall architecture and present uh, a few. Uh, uh, cool visualizations, I hope, um, to you so you can gain an understanding of your application. Since then, you may not realize, uh, you, you, may not have, you may not have the big picture of. Nice. And, uh, nice. Um, uh, we just uh, uh, released the uh, Angular Doc team service uh, a few weeks ago, and that's what I was hoping to talk about. Uh, it's a, a sad service uh, for your team. And also this morning, we released the uh, uh, VS Code extension as a companion of that service. Nice. Nice. So what's the service is to do the static analysis of our applications? Right. Uh, it will scan your source code and uh, extract uh, your, uh, for example, in TypeScript modules, you have the decorators and so on and so forth. And for example, Angular has this uh, component uh, decorator, so we extract the information about the component. And then we also go deep into the source code to uh, look at how you define your routes, for example. And then we uh, piece together all the routes and put them in one, uh, one uh, diagram to show the entire tree. So that's the basic idea. And uh, another cool thing that we, we can do is uh, we uh, pass all your state manage management uh, source code. And we can trace how uh, one action's life cycle touches different parts of your code, and then put together a one diagram. OK, so, so like things like NGRX and um, that sort of thing? Right, exactly. And uh, we, we don't just analyze Angular. We can also do a uh, React and a view and an SJS. OK, OK. So those different uh, frameworks and different platforms. What uh, is that? I guess one of the things I start thinking about when it comes to mind is the fact that uh, Angular is written with TypeScript uh, has to be a big benefit for doing that static analysis. Um, mm -hmm. If you, yes, you can tell us if it is or not, if, if, if you experience that. and then. If we're talking about like React and Vue, is that like vanilla JavaScript, and and does that become more challenging? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely more challenging, and that's why I appreciate uh, TypeScript, and I hope more more and more people will realize uh, the benefit of using TypeScript. Uh, we can still do a good job, but uh, sometimes there are things that we cannot really analyze. Yeah, because I'd imagine my understand. Yeah, it, it's also. I think uh, for the lack of better term, a uh, mess here if you don't use TypeScript. Nice, nice. All right, so um, so it's just this. Uh, you, you mentioned there's a, a extension now for VS Code to go along with this team service. Uh, is there mm -hmm. any other toolings or anything like that, or is it just that the team service and the, the VS Code extension? Uh, the other tooling uh, in the past, we had a. Um, uh, a desktop application that we call uh, Angular Copilot. Uh, it's uh, primarily used for migration because we 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 could analyze Angular JS code. So we're hoping that using this tool, 
we, we can tell you what you have in your AngularJS project. And then we, we let you to uh, use our uh, GUI application to help you with the migration. So if anyone is uh, interested in that feature, uh, uh, please let me know. But uh, uh, today, I guess the focus is not on the migration. Uh, uh, last year in the uh, Solid Cities NG, uh, I did have a talk on the migration about this too. Nice, OK. So not the focus for today's episode, but you do have that tooling there. I do want to ask a quick question on that. So then would it, um, does it then suggest that migration path of, of things to do with your Angular, for Angular side of code to help get your Angular JS up there? Like, will it suggest doing like a, um, yeah, like, I guess that's a question. <laughs> uh, well, it first will help you set up the hybrid application. And and then uh, it will say, okay, since I understand you have uh, these uh, AngularJS components, and I I know this component is uh, part of maybe uh, it's implementing a route, or uh, 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 it, it has these methods that you needed to port over. So we do two things: we can set up the your, a new route in Angular, and we can then. Uh, copy over the uh, methods. We can look at your injections and uh, turn them into constructor parameters, things like that. And then also we had a VS Code uh, extension for you to migrate the syntax in your HTML. So it's a it's a production boost, a productivity boost. I hope. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Um, and again, I would imagine the the strong typing and the TypeScript part helps for that static analysis to be able to identify, you know, like you said, the injectors and and the, the suggestions to make for those that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But everything centers around the static code analysis. Nice, nice. All right. Um, okay, so you want to get into it, and we'll talk about the team service and. Uh, sure. Uh... Let me share my screen. And while you're doing that, looks like uh, Mike is back. Mike, Rocky, how's it going? Not too bad. Sorry, I had to step out. I had a delivery coming in the head. I need to be out there. So I apologize for uh, the intros and everything else. But I'm here and excited to hear about Angular. Nice, nice. All right, looks good. We're ready to go. All right. Okay. So uh, uh, it's a quick intro uh, about myself, and this is my uh, quicker handle, uh, uh, Twitter handle, if you would like to get in touch. And uh, we've been doing uh, the uh, static code analysis for more than two years, I think. Uh, initially, we analyzed the uh, Angular projects and the AngularJS. And uh, these days, we also support React View and uh, most recently, uh, Nest.js. So if you're writing uh, your uh, Express uh, backend using Nest, uh, we, 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 we do support that. Uh, and in re recent weeks, we wanted to see if we could turn this into a SaaS service so you can uh, uh, have us um, help you uh, monitor your application and show you the uh, architecture diagrams for your application and uh, so on as a SaaS service. And just today, we announced that the VS Code extension that's named Copilot, so we can go over that. Uh, so that's bas basically the idea of the uh, products and services we provide. Uh, so let's go uh, to the demo. OK, all right. So uh, this is what uh, it would look like uh, if you um, sign up for the service. Uh, we have a, a demo organization on GitHub uh, that's called Angular Doc Showcases. And it had uh, 16 repos that we followed from uh, various open source projects. Uh, and, and this is the dashboard that you will see. 
after we uh, analyze your projects. Uh, of course, you can select which repo, which project you want to have um, analyzed. So in this case, all 16 of them have been analyzed. And uh, you can see that for each card, we show you the repo name and then the, 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 the project type. We had, uh, as I mentioned, support for Angular, but now we, you can also uh, let us analyze your view or React projects. And uh, we also had uh, special um, processes for uh, NGRX. So here you see this uh, NGRX icon. Uh, this is a project uh, straight from the NGRX repo. Uh, so you can then click on that uh, project and see what uh, we have analyzed for you. And then on the left side, we have this um, toolbar to let you switch between the projects. So here, this is the uh, Angular Jumpstart project from that morning. And from that, you can see that we have um, uh, uh, found 15 modules and 35 components. And then you can uh, filter these components. Uh, uh, the uh, second half of the screen shows you the details of these modules and uh, components. You can filter them by, for example, the component type. And these are all your injectables in your project. And the classes screen shows you <clears throat> all these uh, classes or modules that we have found. And you can look at uh, uh, them by category. And then we have this uh, so-called hierarchy view to show the composition of your uh, uh, Angular modules, uh, the components for each module. And then if the component implements the route, uh, a route uh, shows which route it implements. Um, I, I, and I, then, I apologize. I um, just picked my jar up off the floor here real quick. Um, <laughs> real quick question. So you, you're spawning out from the app module and finding all the dependencies, uh, child modules, and components um, listed here. Is right. that also traversing the lazy loaded uh, modules as well? Well, it doesn't really differentiate between the lazy loaded module or not because this is uh, not a runtime analysis. It's uh, for uh, static code. So if we can, if we saw a lazy loaded module, we, we still try to uh, chase that module and then process that module. So it okay. will show yeah, up. Yeah, well, I'm saying they're discoverable. I mean, because there's no right. formal dependency between them, aside from the uh, load children's uh, magic string there. Right, but exactly. That, that's OK. Yeah, that's how we chase that uh, laser loading module. I like it. And then we sh uh, we show you these uh, modules by their uh, composition, imports, and exports. And these are the SVG diagrams, so uh, you can zoom uh, in and out, and then you can even take a screenshot. So once you do that, uh, it, it's a uh, standalone SVG file and saved in your local drive. Uh, it's, it can embed it in any other uh, documentation you that you might have. And this is the route tree, uh, specifically to show the routes and the import relationship between your components modules. And uh, then we have a. Uh, uh, also, look in your uh, test codes. This project doesn't have uh, tests, but if we switch to uh, Angle IO example from uh, the official documentation, and these are the uh, test cases we found. So, for each spec file, we uh, identified which components are tested in, in the spec file. So we hope that it gives you a better idea of um, your test coverage by component. And uh, then we have a, uh, we analyze your repository. Uh, so this doesn't have a lot of uh, 
because I think we forked it and also, oh, oh, sorry, it's not, um, it wasn't orig originated from a, a GitHub repo, it was lifted from, from the documentation, Angular.io Angular documentation. So it doesn't have a whole lot of history uh, in terms of repository activities, but uh, Angular jumpstart, uh, you can see that uh, the top committer, and these are committers ranked by a number of commits. And uh, you can look at a specific time period. And we also, because we know uh, the association of the component and its files, uh, it has maybe a GS file and a, a HTML file, a template file. Uh, if we touched any of them, it, we know that this component has been modified in some way for this commit, so we can show you component history. And uh, again, you can uh, zoom into a particular period. You can, you can look at uh, each commit. And if you click on the commit, I think it shows you the details about about that particular commit. And you can click on that and you can look at the uh, diff file. It's so can... like Mike was saying, I mean, so many impressive things in here. And my mind is just going crazy with not only the, the things that we can learn about our applications, but something like this I, I see is so powerful for helping you and your teams to help understand uh, how people are working, what their process is, you know, what what went on in the course, not only of this like particular component in the CS Git history, but but this this mapping of you know what was involved in a single commit and uh, from this higher level and looking at the the parts of your app that were part of that commit. It's hard to I find it hard to diagnose that when just looking through Git or or on GitHub, and this makes it more visual. That I mean, I could just see so many possibilities. It's amazing. Yeah, so uh, basically the idea is that if you uh, just look at the repository, you see a bunch of files. But for, from, uh, from our uh, application developer's perspective, these are uh, uh, modules and components. We need to have a higher level understanding of them. So hopefully uh, with this, you can look at the commit by, by how the uh, components work, not just by each individual file that may or may not matter to, to a particular uh, component. Um, and then you can also uh, uh, search by a component or the committer. So if we filter by a customer, you see all these customer. Uh, it's a regular expression that looks at the component name, I think. Now, does this, does this just work with GitHub repositories or any other type of uh, repository yeah. service? Yeah, at this point, we, we only analyze the GitHub projects. But uh, also in, uh, in the China market, there's an, uh, another uh, service called uh, Gitee, I think, G-I-T-E-E. -E. That's their version of uh, GitHub. So we support uh, both of these. Uh, and we could support other types of the uh, uh, repositories, um, but I think uh, what might, might be more important for uh, commercial projects is uh, we provide some on-premise installation. So that's something we are working on. Uh, if you are unwilling to let us access your source code, if you don't host uh, them on the GitHub, if I have uh, private repositories, uh, we should uh, let these people uh, use our service. So that's what we are working on. Okay, so in order to get these um, Git statistics, you're actually running basically HTTP calls to the GitHub API uh, to get the statistics? Right. Okay. We actually look at uh, each of your commits. And for each commit, we look at the files touched, and then we go in our um, database and see which components these files correspond to. Okay. 
And does this, uh, how does it update over time as we make changes and make commits and we update our code base? Is it just each time you come to these tools, they'll they'll have the analysis already done or is that batched? How does that work? Uh, we have a webhook uh, to uh, monitor your commits. So every time you do a push, we, we do a new analysis. So these diagrams are always up to date. And is how uh, how does that that time for how long does that run? You know, in terms of stack now, so obviously it'll I'm sure depend upon the uh, size of the projects and stuff like that. But is it you know fast? Not so fast? Like what can we expect? Uh, for each project, it will be probably uh, just a few seconds. Uh, but for for the commit history, it takes longer because we need to look at each commit. So at least, uh, so this diagram will uh, be populated uh, over a period of maybe 10 minutes or something. But uh, the other analysis is uh, fairly fast. Um, you don't really notice the difference. Um, but uh, if you look at this screen, <coughs> excuse me. Is it, is it not refreshing? Uh, there is some problem with the refreshing issue. So, uh, but if you look at the top, uh, you can actually play the uh, uh, commit history. So this is how uh, you initially, uh, your project uh, had uh, only a few components, but over time you, you modified or added uh, components. So for you to get this whole picture, it takes uh, a while longer. But for each particular point, for, for the most recent ones, it, it's probably a few seconds. Now, I, I realize I missed a little bit at the beginning. Um, and my question is, so you're showing some of the public repos here. If I have my own project that may or may not be on GitHub, I can still take advantage of a lot of this uh, tooling, correct? It doesn't necessarily have to be a public project? Uh, it doesn't have to be public. Uh, the public project, uh, you can use it for free. Uh, we have both, both uh, basically two websites. One is uh, angerdoc.org. Mm -hmm. This is for all the uh, public repos on GitHub. Okay. And we, we had uh, angerdoc.io, that's for your commercial projects. Uh, but both of them uh, currently work uh, against the uh, GitHub projects. So as I was mentioning, we try, we're trying to uh, build a, a Docker image for, uh, pro, um, for, for all the commercial projects to use. So okay. if you purchase this, uh, so, so for the commercial projects, uh, it's uh, $99 subscription each year. Uh, and we hope that we can provide a Docker image to you so you can uh, have this downloaded and uh, integrated into your CI CD pipeline, for example. I like that. Um, yeah, because I like uh, the Git history stuff, and that's uh, interesting. I find a lot more value out of the uh, hierarchy and the uh, statistical analysis there of the dependencies and that whole dependency graph and those visuals. I think there's a lot. Um, to be used there to discern different things about your application as you go ahead and make decisions of, hey, how do I best want to structure my application? Is Are things running efficiently? Do I have uh, some dependencies that I should be moving around? And those types of visuals that you could discern from that information. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, sometimes when you see uh, in, in the diagram, uh, a module that has a huge number of components, you know, that it's not structured correctly. Yeah, there's, like I said earlier, my mind is just going crazy. There's so many things that, that this thing could be advantageous for. Uh, a couple, as you're talking, Mike, I'm thinking about, um, you know, if you go and you say, I'm going to remove some feature from my application, like, how do you make sure you've got all the bits and pieces that you need to get out of there for your code base. And this could potentially show you all the stuff that's related to that, right? But then the other thing it, it, it's really cool for, I think, is like things like you've got maybe like pipes and directives. 
and um, you have your team working on things and you go to build a new feature and you say, well, I need to figure out like, do we have a pipe to do that? Or do we have a directive to do that? Or should I just write my own? This can give you a central spot to kind of visualize, here's all my pipes, here's all my directives. Oh yeah, there's the one that, that'll fit my need. I don't have to go search the code to see if we have one of those. Cause I've ran into that before where, you know, the, the code, the folder structure is huge and, and you have pipes associated with different features and it becomes hard to search through your code to figure out, you know, do I have a pipe to, to do this sort of thing, right? Yeah. yeah I, I, I like the know. refactoring ideas there of saying, all right, well, what, where are my dependencies? Where do they lie? What do I uh, need to touch if I wanted to take something and refactor and do that? Sure, you, uh, TypeScript will give you a lot, but not at the planning phase. You actually have to be doing the work for TypeScript to be able to help you out and say, hey, this dependency here is uh, changed or what have you, or you move something that TypeScript is depending upon. Um, but you get that kind of feedback without necessarily having to make the change uh, by looking at your dependency graph. Yeah, and also you can uh, go through this uh, history and see uh, when a uh, certain component was modified or added, uh, when a new module was added. I hope it provides a quicker way for you to get to that kind of information. I, I don't like that because then Justin can go right in and say, hey, yeah, that bug, that was caused by you, Brocky, and that you, it's totally your fault. And here, look, I can point to exactly when you broke our application. Come on now, Mike, you know I wouldn't do that. It would be, how can we make this not publicly? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, then also you can look at, uh, I think there's some issue with the, uh, with this screen. So you can look at the test cases and uh, say, uh, for this component, you don't really have uh, many test cases, uh, or you, you have not uh, implemented, and you, you need to get to that. Are you able to understand with the static analysis um, and provide like a visual for, let's say, where services are coming from for particular modules, like if, if module C over here, ng module C is is using you know these three services, are they being provided at that module, or are they being provided higher up the tree? Because I think that would be pretty useful to be able to to discern and understand from a, a developer standpoint. Is oh, I, I started just consuming this the service, but but what other module does it lie in, so I can understand the the relationship there? Does that make sense? Yeah, we, uh, we we don't have um, that visualization yet, uh, but we can certainly uh, uh, implement that if if it if you think it's useful. Yeah, that's an so, interesting uh, Maybe it's a provider tree, something like that. Yeah, almost like the uh, injector level of where that's being provided, uh, so that you can determine whether or not you have the same instance or not. Um, but I think that. A lot of that has gone by the wayside with the uh, introduction of the provided in root that I think most services, especially stateless services, uh, tend to get provided uh, at the root level, at the root injector, so that um, everybody's getting the same instance of it. Uh, mm. Again, that's for the scenario of stateless services, so that's not modifying any state in case you need a specific scenario where you need different state for different pieces of your application. Okay. Yeah. One spot where I see it, it happens um, is, you know, we're in our developer tools and we go to use some service that we know about, right? And then we get autocomplete for the import statement of it, you know, assuming that we don't, let's say we don't, our application is not set up with uh, like bundle files to make public APIs and that sort of thing across our ng modules. Um, and so all of a sudden our, our tooling, VS Code, WebStorm, that sort of thing, will complete the import statement for us and bring it in and, and we're kind of rolling using that service, but maybe that wasn't our intent to actually, you know, be grabbing that from some other place or we want to understand that better. So um, I could see some scenarios like that getting in where it might help to, you know, identify that or, or help catch it for us or, or give us more knowledge about that, right? Um, sort of thing. Okay. Okay, I do understand that in this case. 
Well, uh, we have a, a question that came in on, on the chat uh, about, does it provide the ability to analyze uh, build bundles and give you suggestions on how to optimize it? Is that something that, that this tool will do as well, or? Not really at this point. So it's just primarily the, the source code at the source code level that we're looking at and under, getting an understanding of, right? Right. Cool. Um, I have a question. Are you able to dr drill into on the left, do you have the routes listed underneath the application? Can you bring up that view? Uh, I gotta say really quick, the routes are one of my favorite parts of this. This, part, uh, this is the platform's uh, NGRX uh, routes. Maybe it doesn't have a lot of information, but this is the Angular jumpstart routes. And uh, let me find uh, some other Angular projects. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and it's almost like that, <laughs> that could re uh, replace the idea of providing a sitemap on your, in your uh, um, application, or at least to look at this and say, hey, how are my routes structured for my application? Are they making sense? Does it make sense how I have them laid out? Do I want uh, possibly to nest some particular grouping of routes underneath a section like you can see here examples seems to not have anything particular re uh, it does have an examples component um uh uh render there but do i want to introduce something in the url to make it to have it make more sense of what is actually going to be uh rendered at a given route to be able to have that visual of your routes so you can be consistent uh across your modules as well i like that i like all of this I yeah, like I was saying, I get so geeked up over the routes part because it's. I mean, think about it. You've got you know, when we define our routes, especially when we have uh, you know child modules and things like that. We've got the bits and pieces of our route definition table all over in our file structure in our application. And for me, it's so hard to mentally like open all those files to look at all my routes to really get a, a mental map of what's going on. I come in here and and it just reveals it all to me of. of the routes I have defined, the components that that are being hit for those, um, I, I just love it. I love it. That goes to the, like the core idea to me of what makes a good application, and to me, a lot of like the reporting applications out there, the main thing that they do is they take data and they turn it into information, and that's exactly what this is doing. It's consolidating all this information here. Again, the idea of having consistency across your different feature modules. If you have like an orders module and a, a customers model, that the URLs tend to make sense. Uh, that the names of the routes uh, make sense as you uh, look at them. Um, sure, mm -hmm. most users are just going to click through and say, oh, I want to click on this and I'll go there. But when a user is sent a deep link into your application that just looking at it, they should be able to discern where they're going and what type of information they're uh, actually getting to see. Um, and to have the consistency within different parts of your application. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I think the so. I'm geeking out too. I, I'm sorry, I got to say one more thing too, because uh, you just brought that up, like the deep link and stuff like that. I, I think from a deb debugging standpoint as well, when I'm tasked to say, okay, somebody had an issue on this uh, form component, right? And so here's the URL they got to, and I got to trace through that routing structure. Again, I've it, they may that may be you know a mix of different routing tables set up and different ng modules, parent and child, root and child sort of thing. So to trace that through the code is. It, that path through the code is going to take me a bit, but I look at this and I can see the path of, of how they got to that form. So I can know the, all the pieces I need to jump into. All right, but I'm done geeking out, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and then you can click on the component and we, we bring up the uh, source code. So this is all through the web application, the SaaS service, right? Um, and then yeah, this is a web application, but I can show you the VS Code extension in a minute. Be before you uh, do, I, I have one quick question about that, because uh, I know you're talking about linking directly to the GitHub repo. Is this only able to look at the master branch, or are we able to specify, hey, I want to see what the state of the application is in my feature, my foo feature branch, or is it just master or is, 
is that an option to be able to select a branch? I guess is what I'm asking. Uh, we haven't implemented uh, that yet. So it's uh, looking at the master branch only. Okay. Uh, because we're, we're putting all, all these information uh, and uh, if we wanted to chase every branch, it may be too much, but uh, uh, it's just um, a UX issue, I think, how we can design the application to make it intuitive for you to switch context. Uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely would be an undertaking. I was just curious if uh, that functionality existed or not. It, it doesn't yet. Okay. Okay, so uh, I wanted to... your idea. I want royalties. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I really love these discussions because uh, it, it gives me ideas of what we need to, uh, what our room should look like. Okay, so um, I wanted to bring up this um, state management diagrams. So um, we we uh, identified uh, all the uh, modules in your application uh, where you have used the uh, NGRX, and uh, we have, for example, in this example, we have three modules that have uh, NGRX stores, and. Uh, so this diagram will uh, try to put all these um, NGIX related uh, source code and modules uh, and put them into one diagram and hopefully you can make better sense of what's going on. And uh, uh, this is uh, so-called Angular NGIX material starter. Uh, we can also look at what it, uh, it's like in the um, NGIX platform, the uh, source code, they have an example app. And we, we, we also have three modules. Uh, I guess the book, books module has uh, the richest information. So this is the diagram we came up with. Uh, so from the left to right, uh, we start from, uh, and it, it may be, diagram may be uh, hard, too hard to see uh, in detail, but you can zoom in by using your uh, uh, trackpad. So we start from the left side, we have uh, the so-called action dispatches. For example, the uh, load action, uh, load collection, it's loading the uh, book collection. And we can see where this is uh, coming from. It's uh, in this uh, ng on init, and it's uh, initiating this uh, load collection action. And then we put the um, so over that we, we know that its definition is here. And what it does is uh, it's going to trigger the uh, load collection effect. And this is the source code for the load, uh, load collection. And then this load collection uh, will trigger either, I will dispatch either load book success or load book failure. So in case of the load book success, we know that uh, it's going to uh, handle in two reducers. In one reducer, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's populating uh, the, 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 the payload in the in a state, and in the other reducer, I think probably it's going to toggle the uh, uh, loading the loading flag. I think I lost my spot uh, here here uh, here. Yeah, yeah, it, it's turning the loaded to true and loading to false. Okay, so, I wanna, can I just yeah. inject something real quick here? Uh, because right as you said, uh, okay, I think it just lost my spot. And then you got your spot back like right away. Um, when I'm diagnosing NGRX and state stuff like that, and I'm looking at files just through the file system and I lose my spot, I have to start over from the beginning. And, and, and it would take me a while to get, figure out back that backtrack, right? But with this tooling, you just, you're able to see it through the arrows lighting up and, and like got back to your spot. That was very impressive. Very impressive. So, 
So as you were, uh, when you brought this up at this zoomed out view that you're currently looking at, and I looked at this, the first thing that popped in my mind, well, actually two things, was one is that this looks like a whole lot like a database entity relationship diagram, like a big old mm -hmm. ERT. And then my mind went to having this plotter printout that's hung on the wall in the office of looking at how is my data organized. And then it's it's kind of like that type of structure. And then it's also like a data flow diagram, like this, um, uh, I, I can't think of what it's called, it's like a state diagram of how that is flowing through the system. And then you started zooming in and then it's like, they took you took that concept of having this big blown out view and then put it on this big touchscreen monitor and people are pinching and zooming and tapping to view the details of all of this information and then you're showing me the source code that's associated with all of that i can't think of a team that doesn't want that of hey this is how the t take a step back this is how data is flowing through your application and this is how you can visualize it this is how you can find it and debug it and find out your issues and everything else that that yeah that, this is extremely extremely helpful to anyone who was using uh ngrx yeah, I, I think uh, for all the benefits people get from NGRX, uh, one thing that is very different is that now your uh, source code that handles one uh, action lifecycle is scattered all over the place. Yes. And uh, it's hard for, for us to just open up a file and after file and use a global search to find where that action was uh, handled or, or what was going on. And uh, if we put everything back together on one diagram, then you 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 you, you not just not only um, see the, how your 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 NGRX story is structured, you can also uh, yeah. see the, the um, how they interact. So I I know that we start from the idea of like the action that can be dispatched gets all the way flowed through the reducer and potential effects and other reducers and what have you, and then you even have some selectors. My question yeah, is selectors. So these are the selectors for your for your store, and then uh, which selector gets used in which component? That, yeah, that's the final piece that I was looking at. So mentally, you can go back and say, "Hey, I want to take a look at, or I'm looking at this component here, and what is it? Uh, if you're looking at the book exists card. Uh, actually, let's go to the." First example up there, it says find book page component. So, hey, I'm looking at that component. Where is that data coming from? So not only debugging from, hey, this happened, where's the data going to end up? But going backwards and saying, hey, I'm looking at this view in this component. Where is that data coming from? How does that data get to me? And what is potentially causing changes to that data? And yeah, that that's extremely powerful and extremely helpful. Yeah, and uh, then uh, then you can uh, take a snapshot of this. Becomes a SVG file. There you go, Mike. So you can it, it and print it out, put it on the wall. Yeah. I, I've lost access to my uh, plotter printer. <laughs> okay. hmm. I, I, and I don't want it anymore, right? The, the whole reason for that was to be able to get the big view and to be able to drill down. I can do that now on my 13 inch laptop. Mikey's happy. All right. Okay. So uh, I guess and then we can uh, move on to look at the extension that we have provided. Yeah, as you're bringing that up, there's a question in the chat um, where some of these asking if this works uh, within an NX workspace. Uh, NX workspace, uh, we haven't really um, uh, tested it that way. But uh, when we designed the application, we certainly had that in mind. Uh, for example, here, we have basically these uh, multiple projects. Mm -hmm. um, so if you had multiple um, Angular projects, they, they should show up here uh, as uh, additional items uh, on this list. Uh, in this case, we happen to have only one uh, project, but we, we, we should be able to handle multiple projects. 
Excellent. Here's your question, Oscar. Uh, it should the additional project should show up uh, within the uh, navigation tree on the left. Yeah, if anyone can provide a good example of this, uh, uh, if there's a sample report we could uh, include in our showcases, we would love to. I think the Narwhal repo uh, or Narwhal organization on GitHub has some example uh, repositories with NX stuff in it. So that might be a good spot. I was just looking at that now. OK. Okay, so uh, now let me show you what it looks like in VS Code. We have uh, it, it just released the, uh, the uh, copilot for VS Code. Uh, we used to call it uh, Angular Doc, but since we now support uh, in addition to Angular, uh, Vue, and React, and Nest, we thought we should use a different name. So this is the new name. And what it provides is, uh, if you switch to to that view, you get an application explorer. You can look at it in two ways. One, it's grouped by uh, the decorator type. Uh, so if you had a NestJS application, you see in the, uh, uh, where's my, I can bring up a, uh, well, um, uh, if you uh, load the NestJS application, you see a bunch of different uh, decorator types, but you can group them by Angular modules, and uh, you can drill down on the module and look at the components like that. And you also have uh, schematics here. Uh, this doesn't have schematics in, uh, installed. Uh, let me switch this to a different project. So you can look at which schematics you want to use and then go on with this command. Uh, but we also integrate in State Management Explorer, which will give you uh, the same diagram, but it's opened uh, in, in a, a separate column. Uh, it's it's hard to see, but if you zoom in and you click around, you have these snippets highlighted. So when, wherever you click, you quickly jump to that code snippet. Oh, right there in your editor, new information. I, I like that. So is this, a, uh, is this extension free to use, or do you need to have an Angular doc team service account for it to do its thing, or how does that work? Uh, the extension is free to use, um, but uh, this uh, state management explorer is only for people who use uh, team service. So if you had a team service uh, as a paid service on angular.io, or if you had an open source project and you, you, you use the service on the .org, uh, then you can use, uh, then th uh, this trivia will be enabled. So uh, it, it, it's not free uh, technically, but uh, uh, for open source projects, it is free. Um, and the only requirement we, we, we have for these open source projects is I, I hope you can uh, set up your service like this on the angular.org. Uh, the purpose is that we, we hope we can aggregate the information we collect from these open source projects and uh, have a more uh, meaningful, uh, I guess, uh, set of um, statistics for us to look at the overall um, ecosystem uh, for Angular and uh, for maybe maybe React and Vue. Uh, that's our, uh, our motive uh, behind uh, requiring the uh, open source projects to, to still sign up. So if I have my open source project and I want to have it as part of this, uh, what's the process for me? Do I have to submit something to get it to be part of the Angular doc, uh, dot org, or what would that process be? Well, 
it, it's straightforward, I think. I, I hope uh, because this is what we have, right? Uh, on this .org site, we have collected information on uh, on these many uh, repos, and then you. Uh, we want to see, for example, distribution of your Angular versions right, across all the projects, and so on and so forth. Um, so if, if you go to this website, you, you sign in, and then you can do a single click to set up your, your subdomain like this. So it doesn't require a, a, a lot of work. It's just uh, literally a few clicks. But uh, on the back end, we have all these repos information in our database, so we can do aggregations on all of them. OK, so then I would, if I have my uh, open source project, and maybe I have a couple of repositories, I would go to angulardoc.org. I would log in or create a new login, sign in with my GitHub credentials or something like that. And then I would start adding my repositories to my kind of subdomain workspace sort of deal. Is that, was that sound correct? Right, exactly. So you go to angular.org, you, uh, you sign in with your GitHub credential, and then we show you the organizations or your, your own organization. And then you can, there's a single button click to say a set up subdomain. And that will bring you here. Gotcha. OK. Cool. So you get your own subdomain this way. <laughs> Side plus. And then, so is that any, uh, is there any type of requirements for that in terms of like open source e type of project? Or is it just any public, if you, if you have your organization on GitHub that has public repos, you can add those here? Yeah, all the public repos will be presented here. Will will be available for selection. Uh, we don't want to look at any of your private repos. So on .org, we only let you um, select the uh, public repos. Cool. So there's no chance you will accidentally review your uh, your, <laughs> your private. Repos. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. And then. Uh, are, is there any tooling for uh, looking across? And this is probably jumping out because the, first of all, just like Mike was saying, like the, this tooling is amazing and it's it's so complete and does so many things. It's great. Uh, so I just kind of asking maybe for a future reference or uh, is there any type of concept of being able to do analysis across multiple repos? Uh, so if I have a couple different repos in my organization to get an understanding across them, I don't know if there'd be a use case, but yeah. Well, uh, I'm not sure what kind of information you can get uh, across the repos. Uh, I, I mean, if there are, uh, then I, I like to know uh, what kind of use case that will be and how, how uh, then we can figure out how to implement that. I guess just offhand, I'm thinking if I have, you know, three repos in an organization, and one of them is a shared library, and then the other two are different apps, suites that use that shared library to get kind of an understanding of, how those apps, how those different repos are using and consuming a third party library or some other libraries across both of them, that sort of thing, those sort of analysis. And then we'd be going back to my days doing like .NET stuff and, and uh, NuGet and like the challenges with <laughs> understanding how those are distributed across your app. So I don't know, but that's kind of one thing that comes to mind is, is repos consuming other uh, libraries from other repos and getting an understanding of the breadth of that. Okay, uh, I have to say I didn't think of that. Um, but uh, one thing that, that I wanted to do was, uh, since we uh, have in support for Nest.js, I was hoping that we could do something that can uh, let you traverse uh, from the front end to back end. If you have your front end in, in this Angular React, and but the, the back end is uh, in Nest.js. Uh, then we, we understand both your front end and back end. So there, there may be something we can do, do there. Yeah, I think that's an, another great use case, right? For the scenarios where we don't have, let's say, a mono repo where all that stuff's in a, in a single repository, right? And you have those two in separate repositories, yeah, to traverse across that. Yeah. Wish list, but mm -hmm. yeah, so very cool, very cool.
Well, we're getting to the, the top of the hour, so we should probably wrap it up. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention on, on the stuff that you're sharing right now or? Uh, well, uh, I, I was, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, we, we are working on uh, making this uh, analyzer available to the private repos uh, as an on-premise installation. So we hope that if you had concern uh, with uh, letting us um, access your repos, then uh, uh, we will want to address that. All right, so be on the lookout for potentially that coming along, right? Right, yeah. Uh, so uh, let me put up your uh, the, the last slide. Uh, so here are some uh, information. Uh, I guess uh, the most important ones are our official Twitter handle and uh, my own uh, Twitter handle. Cool. So if we want to learn more, we can go to these different URLs or connect with you on, on Twitter to ask some questions and find out more. Right. Nice. Nice. All right. All right. Well, this is uh, very impressive and, and so many use cases I can see for for helping the developer experience, uh, individual, team-wise, the whole, the whole shebang, for sure. So very cool. Well, let's get to some picks. Uh, if anybody has any picks, uh, I guess we have two people. Mike, do you have any picks today? I do have one pick. It is a documentary uh, put out by Stephanie Fluin. Uh, spouse of Stephen Fluin from the Angular team, um, did a documentary about ng-conf from 2018. Um, I will, uh, I'll post that in uh, Slack if you could uh, post that in the YouTube channel uh, as part of the show notes. But it was very well done and uh, very cool. Uh, has me excited to go back again this year. So check that out. Nice. Nice. I watched that. Yeah, that was great. That was great for sure. So cool. Han Yu, do you have any picks that you want to share? Uh, I didn't realize we, we had this, so I, I, I don't have any. No worries. No worries. We kind of just wing it each time. So if we have some, we share them. If not, no big deal. So no problem. All right. All right. Well, Han Yu, thanks so much for uh, taking the time, sharing your time with us doing this episode. We really appreciate it. And we really appreciate you um, providing Angular Dot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Justin and Mike. For sure. Thank All you. right. That's it. That's a wrap. Everybody have a good one. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.